And, and one of the first kind of big battles you had with architects, and seeing as we're um, kindly being hosted by a firm of architects um, this evening, I feel it's only right for me to ask Mira, what is your view of the architectural profession? Well, oddly enough, Cherie, I, don't, I hope you don't mind, but I cross with BDP as well in my own backyard. There was a huge row about uh, the shopping centre in Wimbledon, which is two minutes from where I live and have lived since 1975. And I was very active in a residence association, which managed, we, we did, we actually managed with, with BDP's assistant, reluctantly, but they came, came around in the end, to build a very, very nice shopping center, entirely behind unlisted, but conservation area facades. A perfect example of facadism, which architects hate. Normal people like it, eight to two. If anyone wants to see the ultimate facadism, case of facadism is at its very best, come to Wimbledon, walk out of the station, turn into Queen's Road, there's a church facade, there's a town hall facade, no town hall, there's a church facade, it's boots is behind it, there's a magistrate's court facade, can't remember who's behind that, there's a fire station facade. Mother care. The original scheme would have demolished all of those facades and put something in it that I later found was entered in, in a planning application in Torquay. Those were the days when architects didn't feel any problem putting the same application in, in Wimbledon and in Torquay. But we put up a fight and I think, I think we can all be pleased and happy with what we've got there now. Okay. Let's move on to another group of people who you despise. Um, the, the house builders. We've got some people here with um, um, construction, uh, construction backgrounds. Um, I mean, your big victory, really, with the, with the house building profession related to a practice that they were doing fairly recently, and you mm. persuaded the Council of Mortgage Lenders to, um, to, to crack down to on it. So t tell us about, about that, another campaigning victory. Well, I always received heartbreaking stories and, and you know, repeated heartbreaking stories, quite sufficient to realise that this was not a one-off. But, but, and it was, people were being, people who bought off plan were being sent 14 days completion notices. And the properties that they were told to complete on within 14 days were not habitable, not ready to move into. This caused, as you can imagine, caused some incredible difficulties. Once you've completed, you have to start paying the mortgage. Once you're paying the mortgage, how are you going to pay the rent? If you can't move into the place you've bought, where are you going to live? And the, these were properties with, that weren't connected to the, to the water mains, that so didn't have electricity? Not quite so bad, not quite so bad. But there were examples, uh, there were, mainly the worst thing about them is they were largely still building sites. So it was not that the individual flat was not, although there was quite a lot of examples of the toilet flushing hot water, which suggests something wrong with the plumbing. There were mainly a risk to life and limb in getting to and from your front door, and in some cases, arriving, finding there wasn't a front door. They hadn't finished French polishing it or some such. Now, I, I, this, was, this to me was just unbelievable. And it was happening, it happened especially... At particular times of the year. At the run-up to the half-yearly results. Okay, let's get the buggers to pay off so our half-yearly results will look well, look good. It, it just outrages my sense of natural justice. And I was a, um, I'm a born Libran. Justice is just one of those things. I just said, what do you do about it? What do you do about it? To, uh, appealing to the better nature of house builders is an oxymoron. Better nature house builders mm, don't think so. Who a warning to, to buyers what don't buy off plan? It, it's impossible. So I thought, okay, who can I prevail upon in their, in their own self interest to do the right thing? And the answer was the mortgage lenders. So I spoke to my chap at Halifax and I said, okay, envisage this. You've lent £200,000 for a flat. Completion notice, you pay your £200,000 to the builder. It's not fit for occupation. The buyer drops dead. What are you going to do? You have a bad debt. You have a property you can't sell. It's not his problem anymore, it's your problem. Oh, he said, mm, you've got a point there. And Halifax, in those far 
far past days, had a, probably still do, but in the very large influence on the Council of Mortgage Lenders. And the next issue of their, called Red Book, I think, which is the yes. issue to conveyancing solicitors, was just being, being re revised and rewritten. Very simple. They put into the Red Book that before completion money is paid over, the conveyancing solicitor has to satisfy himself that practical completion has happened. And they spelt out this means either a certificate from the Building Control Authority or NHBC, preferably both. That basically put an end to that terrible practice that house builders were doing. Excellent. And another award for, 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 for Mira's trophy cabinet. Now, moving on from the house builders, an even more odious group of people, apologies if there are any in the audience, estate agents. <laughs> now, um, no, no apologies for knocking them. Um, estate agents, well, I, actually I will go on a small diversion before we get there. House builders are so scared of Mira still to this day. I had a phone call from a very um, luxury house builder who um, was in a bit of a flap and they said, uh, uh, do you know what Mira Bar Halel looks like? And I said, well, yes. Uh, and they said, well, we think she was here trying to have a look at our scheme before we unveil it to the market. And I said, well, well what did this person look like? And they said, well, she looked Jewish. Um, <laughs> and I said, Okay, um, well, you know, give me a bit more to go on, please. Would you and, like and to revise that statement? <laughs> and they said, and they said, well, she looks a bit Jewish, and she was really tall. <laughs> And so, and, the, and I said, well, obviously that can't be Mira, you're, you're, you're very foolish. Or, uh, and they said, oh, well, don't, don't tell her, because it's very embarrassing. So I immediately phoned Told um, Mira, even though I was on a train and my signal kept going. <laughs> <laughs> so unless she was on stilts um, and was lying to me, it wasn't I find this encouraging, her. because well, I good. thought, you're I thought that I had my face on blackboard, um, on dartboards, <laughs> here, there and everywhere. So, so mo moving swiftly on to, to, the, to the estate agents, I mean, the, the regulation of, of estate agents is a subject that, that the Investors Chronicle um, has written a lot about who, who I used to work yes, for. and Property Week um, did And as Property well. Week did a big campaign. The BBC mm -hmm. um, did a, sent an undercover reporter into Foxton's memorably, which many of us probably would have seen. But you have been going on and on about how these people should be regulated for ages. They're still not mm. properly regulated, but you have scored some significant Well, pictures. to my mind, selling agents are actually probably as properly regulated as, as they, they can, can be. be. Because I was never... I had issues with the professional journalists and the professional institutions. I don't believe in regulation by qualifications, examinations, or any other rubbish. The problem with estate agents is just honesty. If they're dishonest, I don't care how many degrees they have and how many qualifications. So the only thing that it will ensure on honesty is redress. And once the, letting, the selling agents were regulated by redress, which they are compulsory redress. By the property ombudsman. By the ombudsman. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I, then I let it go. I mean, the ombudsman is not actually doing a very good job, but I, I just, I'm just too tired to start having a go at him. Okay, hand it over to people in the audience who write about residential property. Go and get Chris Hamer. Yeah. Um, He's really, he's, I mean, for a long time he was saying, well, I have to be careful because they're not, it's not compulsory, and if I, do, if I go too heavy-handed, they will simply not register. Well, it is compulsory now, Mr. Hamer. So, wield your powers. I've come across several issues which I told him. Here is a classical example. In, in sales contracts, some estate agents, I think they've stopped it now, but it was me, not him, put in the words... Do you remember the ready, willing, and able clause? Miraculously, miraculously, it was almost always clause five of the terms and conditions. Whether it was Knight Frank or Savills, it was always clause five, which made me also wonder about whether well, this is some, some sort of cartel going on, but never mind. Um, and it said that if the, if, the sale, if the property is withdrawn from sale after the agent has produced a ready, willing, and able buyer, the owner has to pay the fee even if there's no sale. Now, that's difficult enough, but it was being abused. Agents were, were sending, um, were demanding money, and in London we're talking about thousands, if not tens yeah, of thousands of pounds. One percent of a property sale in London is. It's a lot of money, yeah. even then, and we're talking a few years ago now, even then it was a lot of money. It was, in one case it was 6,000, 9,000 pounds, and the people came to me because the reasons, their reasons for withdrawing the property for sale were genuine reasons. In one case, it was a bereavement. In one case, it was a, a, a marital split. They weren't just doing it on a whim. 
And the only way I managed to get agents to stop doing that was um, by, by getting the Consumer Association to say they would actually take a, 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 a case to court under the unfair terms in the consumer contracts. So that put a stop to that? So that pretty much put a stop to that. Ma many, most of the agents told me they had voluntarily stricken it out of their contracts. Letting agents um, is what I'm going to get Mira to attack um, now, because letting agents still are not regulated, which is something I personally find unbelievable, because they handle enormous amounts of cash, whereas estate agents um, don't. And I, I think everyone probably has had a bad experience with a letting agent um, or knows somebody who has. So. Landlords are usually worse hit than, hit than tenants. Yeah. I cannot for the life of me imagine that a government that finally agreed to regulate selling agents suddenly pulled back and said, but we're not going to regulate letting agents. No idea why. But, on again, half a loaf being better than none, after about 10 years, and I can't claim credit for this myself, although I was part of the, of the campaign, the deposits are now ring fenced. Yes. Deposits are now secure and neither the landlord nor the agent can just steal your deposit, you'll be pleased to know. It's, a, it's, not, it's not enough, but it's, it's certainly got over one of the very worst aspects of, um, of uh, letting agents misbehaviour. Okay. okay, and um, before we move on to the RSES, um, let's talk an, another victory um, you had. Now, um, if you are a property owner, You'll, you'll know all about leasehold enfranchisement, which came in in the early 90s. It basically means that if you're the leaseholder of a flat, you can legally buy out the, the freeholder if you all club together. But in the early 90s, you noticed that this wasn't actually happening very much after the legislation came in. No, I was hearing horrendous stories, not so much about buying the freehold. The stories were coming in about landlords who were issuing their leaseholders with huge bills for major repairs major works and if a leaseholder wanted to challenge the amount they had to go to court and they were very often intimidated before during or after the court hearings and many of them just gave up and paid up there were suicides there were there were bankruptcies it was absolutely dreadful this this is was happening in 9345 in the depth of the residential property recession which i don't know how many of you even remember but properties residential property crashed in about 89 and didn't begin to recover until 96 and in between those two times it was in the doldrums and in those days ground rent landlords were absolutely screwing their tenants tenants the law calls them tenants you buy a 99 year lease or a 999 year lease and they call you a tenant that was the beginning, it was a mindset that emanated from government, from parliament. You cannot own a flat in this country, you can only be a tenant of it. You cannot buy a flat in this country anything other than leasehold. I've, now I've, I've come to accept that, but uh, leveling the playing field between the rights of the leaseholder who paid a freehold equivalent price for a long lease and a landlord who may have 5% or less equity in the whole building. That was something that was absolutely vitally needed to be done and it's the best thing I have ever done in my career and probably the best thing I ever will ever do in my career. We ran a campaign thanks to another Evening Standard editor, the late Stuart Stephen. Rest his soul and God bless him. Any leaseholder in this country owes him a huge debt of gratitude. He happened to be a personal friend of John Gummer who was a Secretary of State at the time. John Major, who was a Prime Minister at the time, was essentially a man of the people. He understood these things, because he wasn't a rich man. And between the campaign in the Standard, Stuart Stephen, John Gummer, and John Major, within six months of the campaign, the campaign was run in late 95, by June 1996, there was a new leasehold bill on the statute book. It was, had problems. A lot of the problems were not ironed out until 2002. But the, the, the situation in which leaseholders, long leaseholders, find themselves now, compared with where they were in 1994-5, is night and day. Night and day. I don't, don't send me flowers. <laughs> Most of the people who benefit from this exchange of legislation don't know my name and that's fine by me.